You have joined the session Lessons Learned from 43 Years of Berry Farming, presented by Farmer and Clemson University Emeritus Professor of Plant Pathology and Physiology, Walker Miller of the Happy Berry in Six Mile, South Carolina. My name is Roland McReynolds and I am CFSA's Executive Director. And Walker was one of the folks who hired me for this job 15 years ago. So it's a special honor for me to be your workshop host this afternoon. Uh, please feel free to use the chat feature to introduce yourself. Um, you can also use the Zoom chat feature to submit questions for Walker or me throughout the workshop. Um, and as well, uh, throughout the workshop, if you have a question in, in response to a, um, uh, something that, that Walker presents, uh, you are also welcome to simply unmute your microphone and, and ask to uh, interrupt. Um, or you can use the raise hand feature uh, in, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and, and we will uh, tr um, try to identify you and, and, and call you to, to ask your question. Um, what, please remember our conference community agreements and keep them in mind when you engage in chat or participate in the group discussions. And with that, I am now going to hand it over to Walker and I'm going to start sharing uh, the slides for your presentation, Walker. Just let me know when you want to advance. Them. Okay, let's go. I don't see the slides yet. Okay, you should see them hey. now. All right, there we go. All right. So one of the features that you see on this slide in the picture on the slide is in the very top of the slide uh, of the picture. In the top of the picture, uh, you got your cursor in the wrong spot, Roland. Bring the cursor down. There is a lake. And that is Lake Kiwi, and that plays an important part in this presentation. You can see the lake actually comes a, around. This is a rather old picture of the farm, but there's more planning now. But the lake comes around uh, to your right of the screen, and uh, we're about 1,500 feet from the lake. The uh, uh, Appalachian Mountains are to the northeast and uh, to the left of the picture is the southeast and so we will uh, that's some of the geography of the area okay I don't know can you see my cursor no you can't okay uh, next slide next slide okay so uh, my first lesson is do not put all your eggs in one basket. Of course, we are a direct marketing farm and uh, that, that applies to uh, what we have learned. Uh, we started out with uh, just blueberries and uh, we quickly found that uh, if something happens, uh, uh, we, we didn't have anything and especially when we were just getting started. Uh, so we're now growing six perennial fruits, uh, blueberries, blackberries, seedless grapes, uh, figs, seedless muscadines, and muscadines, uh, and persimmons. Uh, we have test areas of chestnuts, tea, mulberries, olives, pawpaws, elderberries, and hardy kiwi. And we will be planting test areas this year of jujubes and fajoa. Now, when I mention fajoa, you should know that we are in zone 8A because of that lake that I pointed out in that first picture. Uh, it's a very narrow band uh, around Lake Kiwi, which is an 18,000 acre lake. Uh, and the band is wider on the southeast side uh, than it is on the northeast side, but there is a real narrow band on the northeast side. We further have diversification on the farm in terms of uh, pussy willows and other water tolerant uh, sticks and stems, which we sell in the wintertime, usually from Christmas to Easter, uh, as uh, the stems are sold for dried flower arrangements. And we do a lot of home shows and women's clubs and stuff like that. And the next slide, uh, who am I? Uh, 
As Roland mentioned, I'm a retired professor of plant pathology and physiology from Clemson. I'm a farmer. Uh, uh, I first got into the farming business when I went in 1953 with an old eight in tractor. And I hired out myself for 75 cents an hour, my tractor for a buck and a half an hour. And I was about 12 years old. Uh, I worked in extension at the University of Delaware from 1970, 68 to 71 and uh, started in Clemson in 71 and started the Happy Berry. One way to look at it is 1975, because that's when I started looking for a site to farm. And I took four years uh, hunting a site. Uh, the message here is that farming is not a widget business. It's all about sequestering and uh, the breakdown of carbon over the long haul, hundreds to thousands of years. Uh, I, I try and have as much knowledge as I can about the site. Uh, it's soils, which are old cotton soils, uh, had about a half percent organic matter when we started. Uh, and the history of those soils, which had probably 20 plus percent uh, organic matter uh, prior to the arrival of the white man. Uh, the area in which the farm is located was a savanna, uh, and that savanna burned annually. And that carbon, as a result of that burning, uh, and the buffalo and all the other ungulates uh, build up a really fertile soil in this area. But it's gone now due to 100 years of cotton. So you need to understand its air layer and its movement. As we've already discussed, the mountains are on the uh, northeast side. And uh, its water tank, by water tank, I mean the uh, Soils at the farm range from a couple feet deep to 10 or 12 feet deep. And that 10 or 12 feet of, of soil represents the, the water tank. Uh, rainfall exceeds evaporation about uh, November 1, and evaporation exceeds rainfall about May 1. And during the winter, we fill the tank, and then we use that tank judiciously throughout the season. Uh, and we count on that tank of water in addition to we are totally uh, trickle irrigated. So uh, we need to understand the organisms that have occupied and their microbiome. And we'll talk a little more about microbiome and uh, the bacteria, insects, nematodes, viruses, whatever. And then the changing environment that all of the above occupy and our environment is changing significantly at the Happy Berry. And then in the next slide, we'll talk about some of this. So who do you go to work for if you're gonna farm? Uh, not for money, that's for sure. Uh, we're, we're able to pay uh, salaries and pay the help, but uh, really what we're working for uh, our goal is the planet's future and who you work for and who I work for and who we work for are the plants that occupy the site. They are your master. I heard a presentation one time uh, where the speaker said, uh, hey, cattle are one of the most, based on numbers, successful organisms on earth. And that's because organisms provide, humans provide for them. Uh, so that's who we're working for, uh, the plants or the, the uh, animals. And so, and we have come up to this point, to my way of thinking, the age of competition. And um, where I grew up was next to uh, uh, Uncle Doopy, who was DuPont Chemical Company at the time. Uh, along the Brandywine River and the advertisements that we saw when we got television were better living through chemistry. Uh, we used 
and still do herbicides to eliminate competition, insecticides, same, fungicides, same, oh, trying to eliminate competition. We, farming is, I think, are embarking upon a new age of cooperation. And uh, that is what we're trying to do at the Happy Berry. So in the next slide, uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, well, we'll talk about that as we go along here. Site selection, I spent four years uh, working on the site. I fortunately was good friends with a agro uh, meteorologist. And so and what I used for a bio indicator of uh, where frost would occur or was not occurring was kudzu. Uh, in the fall of the year, in my trips around the state in extension, uh, I would observe the kudzu and mark the locations. And uh, then uh, Dale Linville and myself, we confirmed with satellite data. And that was the days when you used a forklift to get the data into the machine. Uh, uh, I spent time after purchase of land and clearing of it. Uh, I spent from 79 to 81 clearing land. I was a sundowner uh, studying air movement with smoke. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I going on in the background here. Hey, uh, something's going on in the background. All right, uh, hilltops are warmer, as you most of you probably know. Uh, during radiational freezes, and radiational freeze freezes are nine out of ten of your frost events will be radiational freezes. At least that's the history, and one of them of those ten is going to be an advective freeze. Now, a radiational freeze occurs when there's little or no wind at, at night when the frost is occurring. Uh, an advective freeze is that the wind speeds are four or five miles per hour or better. And uh, quite frequently can be quite a bit more of that. And there's really nothing you can do about uh, radiational freeze, except we have done some site modification as you'll learn here in a little bit. So we also looked at the frost hardiness of the crops we were growing. Uh, for example, blueberries, uh, our first crop, uh, a variety called Centurion. I actually measured the uh, temperature of the Centurion plant flowers, blueberry flowers, uh, down to 17 degrees, and then came back and that flower had survived that, that temperature. So it, it's got ice water in its veins. Uh, Climax is, excuse me, uh, a uh, variety that is very frost sensitive. And so it needs to go in the high spots on the farm and uh, uh, the tolerant varieties, uh, the low spots. In the next slide, we'll continue with site selection. And uh, so in the next slide, Roland, hello. Rolling. <laughs> All right. Uh, we, uh, I had a grower friend that was putting in new wind machines and he offered me, I said, if you get rid of it, uh, it's yours. And so uh, we installed a wind machine on farm that inversion uh, uh, that was created by the lake and the mountains to the northeast. Uh, and what an inversion is, is where cold air slides underneath of warm air. So the mountains to the northeast of the farm, the cold air slides off the mountains at night onto the surface of Lake Kiwi. And then the uh, warm air that was on the surface of Lake Kiwi, which was warmed uh, by the water and also picked up moisture from the mortar is pushed up over the farm at approximately between two and three o'clock in the morning is what we found during radiational freeze. 
uh, we located the wind machine in an appropriate spot in the middle of the farm that was uh, so that it could reach the inversion. And uh, what the wind machine does is it uh, creates a vortex. Uh, just like when water goes out of a tub or a sink, and it goes in a circle as it goes out, uh, that wind machine creates a vortex that pulls the warm air from above, <clears throat> excuse me, and spreads it out over the farm. Uh, we turn on when the temperature at the base of the machine is uh, about 35 degrees and there's no wind or certainly no much, not much more than four miles per hour. We have an on-farm weather station where we can monitor what's going on wind-wise all the time. Uh, so, uh, so if it's no use turning the wind machine on, you prob probably could hurt it. If, if you turned it on during an advective freeze. This picture in here is the picture of the valley. That's the Kiwi River there you see uh, prior to the lake being installed. So you can see that it was a, uh, a rather wide lake uh, that is at best about 75 feet or 100 feet deep. Uh, if you get right over the old riverbed, it's probably a hundred, but uh, it's it's a shallow lake. So if we in the next slide, we're still talking about site modification here, and one of the things we learned is that blackberry droopwoods or blackberry flowers uh, are damaged by temperatures over eighty-five degrees Fahrenheit, and so I thought, all right, that's simple solution. I'll just put shade cloth over the blackberries. And I used the Luminet 50% shade cloth. But the bottom line, what I, we found from the shade cloth, though, although the heat was delayed, uh, didn't get hot underneath the shade cloth till later in the day, it actually got hotter in the long run. And we actually had more damage with shade cloth. Uh, and uh, who hasn't walked underneath a uh, shade tree and not felt 10 degrees cooler? And my reading at the time uh, was about cities that were cooling themselves by planting trees uh, in, the, uh, in their cities to cool themselves off. So I said, well, uh, why not plant trees on the farm? The next question became what trees to plant. And so uh, my knowledge of trees told me that pine trees are non-epicoric. That means that if you cut a branch off, a branch does not return where you cut it off. Therefore, we could uh, engineer the site with the, the uh, pine trees that here in this picture at the bottom, you can see the wind machine, and you can see pine trees starting to grow. And what we do is limb those pine trees up. I, I left the limbs on while the wind machine could blow around them. And it creates a little vortex on the backside. And, uh, but uh, as the trees grew, uh, uh, we have limbed them up. And I have a picture later on that shows that and we're continuing to uh, limb them up. The, we tried three different trees, uh, loblolly, which has a 100-year lifespan, Italian stone pine, 250 years, and longleaf pine, which has five leaf, 500 years. And turns out longleaf is kind of brittle, and I doubt that we'll plant anymore, and it's very slow. Uh, but the Italian stone pine has done very well, and loblolly has done very well. The loblolly, because it's fast growing, is what we focused on first, but uh, we have had enough Italian stone pine trees uh, planted now that we're, we're continuing to plant Italian stone pine, working on a, our plan. Uh, uh, nice thing about Italian stone pine, you can change the slide, uh, is uh, 
it's a nut pine and it, go ahead and change the slide. There we go. Uh, the, uh, and produces pine nuts. So and if any of you have been in the store recently, pine nuts are going for a fantastic price. So we have a crop for the future uh, as we take the uh, Loblaw out and replace it with uh, Italian stone pine. It's a long, gradual plan. Uh, so that evaporation, evapotranspiration from the uh, pine needles uh, cools the, uh, the site uh, as much as 10 degrees or even more some days. Um, the, and you can see this, uh, we're a pick your own farm and you can see the baby strollers uh, congregating around the pine trees on the farm as people try to escape the heat. Uh, it turns out that, you know, the question is, how much shade can a blueberry bush tolerate? And if we look at the research data on soybeans or tomatoes, uh, that there is a curve here uh, from zero to 40% sunshine, that line on the curve goes almost, almost vertical uh, up to about 40%. And then at 40%, it starts to bend over a little bit and between 40 and 60%, it's still fairly uh, rapid carbon dioxide fixation. But once you go above about 60% and into 70%, that curve almost levels off until it gets to 100% uh, sunshine. So the, the point here is that if you have 60% sunshine, you are getting most of the sunshine. And so uh, that, that's well, where I'm going with this and what we're depending on. Uh, you can go ahead and change the slide, Roland. Uh, and uh, so the issue is what direction do you plant them? If you plant them east-west, uh, you can, uh, the sun goes over east west and so uh you you've minimized the shade yet you're protecting the plants that are on the the south side of the pine trees uh passive frost protection so uh and that or we could plant them north south and we could increase the amount of uh, shade as the sun goes over east west and the shade would move from one side of the pine tree to the other so uh so we opted for north south and uh we are getting passive frost protection i think i may talk about it a little more later and uh, the pine trees are mycorrhizal here's one of the mushrooms i think it's suillus uh that is growing underneath our pine trees uh, in the blueberry system. Uh, and those mycorrhizal fungi are, they exchange information and uh, nutrients and water with other mycorrhizal in the area. Uh, and so they vastly in here. increase the reach of the root system. Okay. Uh, no, I came in. Able to, root system 40 to, years of berry picking uh, lesson or something is there a question hello is there a question okay uh it, nutrient is they're able to gather nutrients uh uh phosphorus and uh all sorts of nutrients from much further than the root system of the pine tree and bring it back and uh, it's my belief that the mycorrhizal system of the pine tree is sharing uh, the nutrients and uh, providing those mycorrhizal, also providing for hydro hydraulic uh, redistribution of the water from the uh, soil water tank. Uh, and uh, the, the pine the blueberry bushes and the blackberry bushes and the muscadine grapes uh, uh, simply love uh, pine trees. They have no problem. They're very happy. Uh, 
Not only that, we use uh, cool. uh, side delivery mowers. This, is like, this guy is like a Is there a question? Scientist. Hello, is there a question? Uh, the, uh, there's no question. Okay, the, the pine needles are recalcitrant, meaning that they uh, don't break down rapid, rapidly versus the grass, like in this slide here. Uh, I can't see the slide rolling. The slide went away. Uh, the uh, grass provides soft carbon. Uh, I've got the gallery up and uh, I'm not seeing the slides. Uh, let's see here. Uh, all right. Yeah, I can catch up on my system. Whoops. All right. Uh, and so uh, this brings up the issue of the weed free zone. I saw Wayne Mitchum, the extension weed specialist in North Carolina, uh, a plots where he varied the width of the herbicide strip underneath blackberries. If the strip was real narrow, the yield was low. If the strip was real wide, uh, it was high. Uh, and so there, you've got to wrestle with that issue. Uh, using side delivery mowers, uh, we put all the grass clippings, pine needles. Uh, we actually cut the tops of the blueberry bushes off. Uh, and uh, uh, because the blueberry stems, uh, once they're over a half, five eighths of an inch, just won't go through a rotary mower, but the rest of it will. And we put that all underneath the bush and we've been able to increase our carbon in, in row uh, from a half percent to eight to nine percent. And that, those measurements were made uh, several years ago. I'll bet it's higher now. By, putting recalcitrant soft carbon under the bushes. So uh, in the next slide, uh, what you see here is uh, a uh, Adams retort. It's a kiln, uh, K-I-L-N. And what it does is uh, burn blueberry stems, uh, if you will. Uh, that are too big to go through the mower uh, in the kiln and without oxygen. And that charcoal can be charged with microorganisms and fertility. Uh, and so all that carbon can be right, spread back on the farm and increase cation exchange, uh, anion exchange. Uh, I'm sorry, is there a question? Free, is there a question? Hey, is there a question here? Can you all mute, please, Creed? Do we all use what? I'm just wondering if Creed could please mute because they're, they're not on mute and we're just hearing all their stuff. So it's confusing because I want to hear you, Walker. Okay, we have 3,000, <laughs> probably 250 bushes, and the, there's usually, uh, uh, at this age of our planting, about 40 years old, there's usually three or four stems per bush, and so we have a lot of carbon uh, that we can put back on. Now, unfortunately, I'm, we've been unable to afford it, and that's our dream, is to put a, uh, uh, a biochar kiln on farm. Uh, by the, oh, uh, what'd you do? <laughs> my Phoenix uh, or a paper towel? So you have greater tolerance to uh, droughts because of the water holding capacity. Uh, you have greater infiltration rate into the that water tank uh, because of the carbon added to the soil. You have uh, an opportunity to capitalize on nitrogen fixation since you now have an anion exchange. Our anions are phosphorus, sulfur, and nitrogen. And you have a sink for nutrients that are transported by the mycorrhiza. The mycorrhiza live in, 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 the, in the char, in the biochar. And so in the next slide, uh, so we're, 
we can could build our soil carbon to who knows high level, how low, how high. <laughs> One dreams uh, is to have a kiln. Uh, now, pyrolysis, which is the name of the process where you burn without uh, oxygen, uh, is an exothermic process. So, in that previous slide, the the uh, chimney next to uh, the people standing next to the kiln uh, was the starter fire. And once it gets to 280 degrees inside the kiln, then they can shut that starter fire down and prevent any further oxygen from any entering. And the chimney on this side is the exhaust gases, which is still a problem. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, I'd like to see a kiln that would go 50 years. That'd be great. In the next slide, uh, the lesson to be learned here is that fruit crops that bear on uh, the current seasons wood, like figs, as illustrated here, uh, are less likely to be damaged by a late spring frost. And so we have focused on uh, planting figs, we can't grow enough of them. Persimmons, we can't grow enough of them. We've planted mulberries, but we're having troubles there. Uh, what we've learned that uh, that uh, more uh, more that the southern mulberry is about the only one you can grow. But we're we're trying a new one called Gerardia. Uh, so mulberries is uh, is still up in the air. Uh, and we uh, varieties can vary significantly in their susceptibility to frost. So for example, in uh, blueberries, the variety Centurion, I have physically measured uh, the temperature of flowers of the variety Centurion down to 17 degrees Fahrenheit and still had that flower come through. Uh, that variety has got ice water in its veins. It's absolutely amazing. We have never missed a crop of centurions and say, hey, the name of the game is you got to have a crop. Uh, and so, uh, and actually we found, even though it's a darker blue, not the pale blue, uh, we have customers that request that variety uh, specifically. And so we have to pick by variety. We don't do that most of the time, but when the centurions are in, uh, we have to pick by variety. Blackberries, the variety Chester, for example, doesn't bloom to May 15th. And the Vaughn, uh, it uh, blooms late April and early May. So those are two late varieties that generally escape the frost. Chester, for sure. We've never missed a crop of Chester. So in the next slide, uh, I want to go into some of the problems that we've encountered. Perennial weeds in a perennial system are a real problem. Of course, you want to start out by controlling those perennial weeds uh, so that you start out with no perennial weeds. But these perennial weeds are airborne, surface borne in the guts of vertebrates. Uh, and uh, so they're going to move into your planting and it's, it's going to become a real problem. Uh, and some of them are listed here. Um, bindweed is terrible. <laughs> uh, and it has roots that can go down 20 feet deep in the soil. Uh, it, it's, and it's perennial. Uh, Virginia creeper is another terrible one. River privet is another terrible. These are not controlled by your pre-emergence herbicides, uh, uh, they, they, they're gonna be out there. They have big seeds. Uh, so many of them, some of them uh, have rhizomes, maypops, horse nettle, clematis, bittersweet. Uh, if you pull them up, uh, you pull one up and you're gonna get two uh, in return. And so it, it's uh, a really difficult problem. Uh, there are many weeds that have big seeds that, when, that persist 
uh, till the herbicide runs out and uh, uh, then they germinate and go. Morning Glory is classic for that. It's a big seed, sickle pod and crow layer. These are actual annuals uh, that can be really problem weeds in, in a perennial system. And so when I see one of these weeds, I'll stop, pull up the weed, make sure it's in a spot where it's gonna get chewed up by the next trip of the mower. In the next slide, uh, you see may pops here in a blueberry bush. And what we do to address this problem is what we call walkabout. Most of these weeds cannot be pulled up and it does no good to cut them off because they just grow back. So we mix up a, a mixture of triclopyr and glyphosate, which many of you probably know is Roundup and crop oil uh, undiluted in a mason jar. I know the EPAs, <laughs> but we label that jar with poison and what's in it. And we use uh, a, a small paintbrush. We just put it in the jar and we use uh, surgical gloves. Uh, and whenever we see one of these weeds, the first time around for our first walkabout took a long time. Uh, but when, right now, if we go and pass, say, in the lawnmower, we'll stop, get off, and cut it off and paint the stem with the herbicide. I've tried other ways, toothpicks, uh, uh, drilling holes in it, putting a toothpick in it. Uh, uh, this has worked well for us. It's a hands and knees operation. So, um, uh, Virginia creeper, it, it, because it grows in such close association with the, the blueberry bush uh, or whatever it's growing, uh, the only solution so far has been hand pulling. Uh, the same is true of bittersweet. It's uh, the, the stems are thin, easy to miss, uh, but, and unfortunately, our current herbicides uh, do not cover it these seeds, most of them are big. So we number our rows uh, and we try our best to learn all our weeds and their characteristics. And we try and, and using row numbers map where those weeds are so that we can design a herbicide program that will address those weeds. Um, we, uh, keep notes and where they're at, and unless they are universal like crabgrass or bahia grass, uh, uh, we enter them on our map. We do it by hand, uh, but what we really need besides the map is a spreadsheet uh, of herbicides on one axis and weeds on the other axis so that we, when we come across a new weed, we can add it. Uh, or we can, if we one weed is becoming a problem because of resistance or something or that, we can quickly scan to find what uh, our tactic might be to control that weed. We send a significant amount of time developing a full year plan and a year to year plan for each crop. And so uh, we do all the herbicide applications by backpack and the reason for that, we're, we're mountain land or uh, uh, foothills land and uh, the, the terrain is uneven. And if you put a herbicide wand on a tractor, uh, you have no control over where that herbicide is being sprayed. You, you've lost the capacity to direct that spray. And so there's no substitute for having an intelligent being at the end of that herbicide wand so that you can direct it at your target uh, accurately. Uh, so uh, the next issue that our lesson learned is that with blueberries and grapes, uh, uh, especially the seedless grapes, uh, you need a good crop of leaves going into the fall to have a good crop of, of flowers that uh, if you have a frost and you have a hundred thousand flowers out there and you got 
that frost kills 50% of them. You still got 50,000 flowers uh, uh, left. Uh, so uh, that, that's part of the reasoning of, of that. And so in this picture, on this slide, uh, you can see uh, the, uh, the wind machine. You can see the pine trees. They're starting to be limbed up in this particular picture. And you can see the the center two rows there have less sleeves than the two out. Right, so difference between primary and secondary pathogens. Primary pathogens are those which are going to be a problem no matter what you do. Secondary pathogens uh, or facultative saprophytes are uh, if you increase the health of the bush, you can control it and or even the bush becomes resistant to it and so and when we're talking about leaf disease here uh, uh, this slide illustrates you can see the wind machine there it's centered on two rows which don't have too many leaves and then there's two rows either side of that which have leaves and what we found is that uh, if you have leaves on the bush you can double your number of flower buds for the season or even more. Uh, and so if you have a frost event, uh, uh, I'm not muted, Roland. Uh, if you have a frost event, then uh, the, uh, if you lose 50% of the flowers, uh, you still got, if you had a, 100,000 flowers out there, still got 50,000. But if you've only got uh, 1,000 flowers out there and you have a frost, you've got not got many. Uh, and so you've lost your, your crop. So, um, so it's important that you carry a good crop of flower buds. And that's important for blueberries and seedless grapes, the Arkansas varieties. Uh, and somewhat important on other, other plants, but critical in seedless grapes and blueberries. Uh, so uh, mummyberry is another one of the, the uh, leaf diseases or the rust and, uh, uh, on blueberry. And mummyberry is another primary pathogen. And so we apply our control strategies for mummyberry prior to the berry being on the bush and then scout to make sure that we got control. And usually we do because we understand the life cycle of mummyberry. And I don't want to go into the life cycle of mummyberry, but if you prevent primary infection, uh, then you don't have secondary infection. If we get some se secondary infection, we know where it's at through scouting and we can focus uh, our control program the following year more intensely in that area. So, um, so in, in the next slide, let's see here. All right, uh, we're talking about uh, Exobacidium white spot, which is a primary pathogen on blueberries. And uh, you can see symptoms there on the berries. There's actually symptoms on leaves and stems, but they're a lot harder to identify than on the blueberries. Uh, we can apply uh, liquid lime sulfur uh, on the blueberries in February or even late January when we have an appropriate window of weather. Uh, and uh, control this organism. Uh, so I'm not sure whether lime sulfur is considered organic or not, but that's how you would uh, control that one. And we've done fairly good with that one. Some varieties are more susceptible to this problem than others. I haven't got a good handle on that. Uh, so uh, Botosphere dieback is another example of a primary pathogen pathogen that has interaction with uh, the Oberia stem borer on blueberry. The uh, borer can bore down the cane, uh, create stress because it hollows out the, in, 
center of the cane, and then botrysphyria drops on that. And under stress conditions, if the bot botrysphyria makes it to the root crown, it uh, kills the plant. And uh, it may take it four or five years to kill it, but it, it, that plant is a goner, and you might as well chalk it up and pull it out. Uh, well, the other tactic is to prune it out just as soon as you see that you've got a cane dying back. So uh, that, that's, uh, so, all right. And then the next slide, uh, it's insects of blueberry and the oberry stem borer. It was a real problem for us initially, but it's fairly rare now. Uh, we have plants that grow around the lawn, and uh, uh, and we uh, uh, break out the obera stems uh, just as soon as we see them. And at times, we have actually offered a reward of a free pound of blueberries for every stem they brought in that met our our requirements. And some people have gotten a lot of blueberries. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so that's one that's, that's primary that uh, increasing the health of the bush is not going to do it and uh, it's going to invade from your neighbors. Uh, fruit worms, uh, they're another primary problem, but we've been able to control them with uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. There are several trade names out there uh, for that. and. Uh, works well. Blueberry maggot, we had a problem with it initially till I understood what was happening. Uh, what you've got to do is remove wild blueberries from around your planting. And there is lethal baits that you can use to, as a perimeter treatment around your planting and uh, uh, get them as they're coming in. And once you get them under control and eliminate wild blueberries, uh, around your planting, uh, the problem pretty much goes away. Spotted wing Drosophila, we do not spray for this invasive species. Uh, we, what we do is we have a significant cooler treatment uh, that the, uh, we have it try and have at least 36 hours in the cooler before we sell. Uh, that'll really knock the spotted wing Drosophila eggs and larvae in the head. Uh, we also promote hummingbirds in our planting and we teach our customers to uh, refrigerate. Uh, and, uh, but when it gets to primocane blackberries, uh, it's all over what shouting. We'll get to that in a little bit. So uh, in the next slide, uh, vertebrates and uh, you can see there's a pine bowl. He note the short ears. Uh, we don't have much of a problem with metabols, but pine bowls are, are a problem, especially initially uh, near pine forests. Uh, and what we've found is that you've got to avoid clump grasses. We've crabgrass, uh, bahia grass, uh, are, are great grasses, uh, but uh, clump grasses are not, especially uh, the ones that are cool season clump grasses. Uh, that's the forage for the pine roll. So by eliminating uh, clump grasses, and uh, we have used roseau bait, but we don't use it much anymore. Getting rid of the clump grasses was key. Birds, robins specifically, uh, they arrive late July and leave late August. Uh, they eat five to 700 pounds a day, maybe more. Uh, we sometimes have two and three flocks that uh, come in. We use uh, bird guard distress recordings and we use uh, reflective devices. You've got to have a, a many different options and be able to not turn it on and leave it on all the time. They uh, habituate to, to it. Um, deer, high velocity lead has been the only real solution. We've tried uh, repellents and hair and all sorts of things. 
uh, they eat the thornless blackberries, they can do significant foliage damage. And they also eat flowers on both the thorny and the thornless. Uh, the groundhogs, uh, they eat persimmons uh, and they leave holes that can roll a tractor. We have rolled tractors on our place at least a half dozen times. Uh, what we found is conibear traps is the solution. And here I am down here in the lower right uh, with uh, uh, last night's catch of uh, groundhogs. Rabbits uh, are a problem. Uh, they mainly eat the agristarts. Uh, uh, and what we use there is foot high blueberry tubes or foot high tubes that in the grape industry, they use these. They come as four foot lengths. We buy the four foot length and cut it up into one foot lengths. And uh, uh, a side benefit that it also uh, protects the these uh, agristarts, which are very small plants, you know, something like this, uh, that are from the any herbicides we might use. Uh, so uh, in the next slide, raspberry crown borer. If you're growing blackberries and don't control the raspberry crown borer, you're going to be out of business in five years. Uh, it's just the, the but uh, we use a root crown drench uh, of a uh, insecticide by Fenifrin uh, uh, in September and October after we're through harvesting uh, in the blackberries. And uh, so, uh, uh, and it, they're relatively easy to control, but you got to do it. Pine psyllid, uh, many of the older varieties have a I problem with pine fluid. And, uh, but the new varieties, for the most part, are resistant. Uh, strawberry clipper is another primary problem. Uh, it's usually very early and gets your very early uh, varieties. Uh, and uh, what we found is that uh, they can do a lot of damage. But if you once get them under control, uh, uh, they, that, that by friend of friend or something <laughs> applied after harvest, something. Uh, and there's also the issue of compensation. Uh, blackberries are born on a raceme. And if you cut one of the flowers off or several of the flowers off, the issue is, do the other berries that remain on that racine uh, compensate, grow bigger, heavier? Uh, I don't know of any good, good data on that, but I suspect that is the case. So uh, spotted wing drosophila, uh, you heard me talk about it on blueberries and what we do. On blackberries, uh, I just throw up my hands. Uh, there is not enough volume in the primal cane blackberries we have now, which are prime arc 45 and black magic uh, to justify going out there and spraying them. My customers don't want me to spray them. And so we just let them go. Uh, and uh, of course we do use uh, the uh, we we plant flower forage around the farm, for example, coral bean that uh, provides nectar for hummingbirds. Uh, we have a, a cadre of uh, uh, hummingbird feeders that we try and assign one person to keep them full. Uh, but still, the that invasive species is uh, a real problem uh, in the primal cane blackberries. Uh, the uh, mites, uh, we've got two, uh, two spotted mite, and the, which you probably all know, but uh, this is a picture here of the broad mite damage. Uh, note how the leaves are curling under, 
and how that tip of that primal cane is uh, turning yellow and white. Uh, so resistant varieties uh, uh, and is the solution there. Uh, and so we, if we see mites on something, uh, one that's very susceptible is Chickasaw. We like Chickasaw because it's tolerant of viruses, but uh, it's uh, uh, very susceptible to two-spotted spider mites. The broad mite, uh, the only option you have is Avermectin. Uh, it is sold under several different trade names. Uh, uh, some people consider it organic, I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, there is another chemical that is labeled, and uh, but it is not available here in the Southeast. It is available in California. Um, it's called Magister. Uh, uh, I, I guess it's a supply chain problem, uh, but it was a problem even before COVID. So, uh, uh, I, I'm worried about resistance to avermectin. I've been using it for several years now. And so, uh, all right. Blackberries, lesson 19 and 20. All right, diseases. Double blossom. The picture on the right on this slide is um, uh, a picture of double blossom. It's a Primary pathogen, but resistant varieties is going to be your solution. Chickasaw, for example, even Chester is susceptible to it. Uh, and how susceptible is an important issue. On Chester, uh, it's relatively tolerant or resistant to double blossom. And we hand rogue any double blossom infected uh, flowers that show up on, on the Chester and throw them down, making sure that they're in the row middle where we'll mow them up with a mower. On the left there is orange blotch. And the real problem with orange blotch is that crack that you see in the blotch. Uh, Leptoseria, uh, another fungus, invades through that crack and can eventually take the cane out, especially if there's a lot of cracks on that cane. Uh, and so these are the symptoms and the, the problem of orange blush. Phosphorus acid, uh, probably not organic, but it is a nutrient spray. Uh, six to eight application at two week intervals starting in early July, June. And so is the control strategy. Uh, uh, botrytis, we don't have much of a problem of botrytis in uh, blackberries, so, but of course we're picking our own operation and we uh, also pick ourselves. And so we pick every day uh, over the planting. So we don't have many berries get old in the planting between the you prickers and, and our pickers. Uh, uh, botrytis has not been a problem. now. If you're picking every two or three days, you're probably going to have a significant problem, probably have to spray because it is a primary pathogen under that situation. Leaf and cane rust uh, is a primary problem. Uh, the answer is resistant varieties. There is one variety that I'm super impressed with, uh, developed by John Clark out of the Arkansas program. That is Cato or Cato. Uh, John chastised me for pronouncing it wrong, but I can never remember which is the correct way to pronounce it. Uh, uh, so uh, it is uh, an amazingly vigorous variety. We planted that one uh, spring of one year, March, and uh, by the end of the second leaf, we had a full crop of cane, so we'll have a full crop in the third leaf. Viruses, there's at least 39 different viruses of blackberries. Uh, and uh, early on, I talked a lot about tolerance. Uh, the thorny variety seemed to have more tolerance to the virus. 
but you're going to have to replant when the virus gets bad, and you'll know those droplets uh, uh, abort uh, with the viruses, and you'll have a berry out there with only two or three droops on it, or greatly misshapen. Uh, 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 you start clean, but within six weeks, I've found you're going to have virus coming into your planting, but it's usually uh, six or seven years, uh, maybe longer, depending on variety, uh, before the uh, uh, there's enough virus to warrant taking it out. Trellis system. Um, Walker? Yes. Uh, question. Before we move on to tre trellis systems, um, Nancy Herndon asked, what varieties of blackberries uh, specifically are resistant to mites? Going back to the previous slide. Oh, resistant varieties. Well, I, I'm better at uh, the susceptible ones to avoid. Chickasaw should be one that you avoid. Uh, Kiowa should be one that you avoid. Um, and uh, uh, those are the two that stick out in my mind. Most of the new ones are, but I have heard of growers having uh problems with mites that uh and so i would listen to your neighbors if they say a variety has mites avoid it because there are lots of good varieties that have tolerance to mites so uh all right trellis systems uh i've tried most of them uh and a V trellis, which I picked up from Urban Weinberger in North Carolina, uh, has been the, the most labor, uh, labor is least with that system. Some of the flip trellis systems, I find the labor to be too intensive. Uh, the I trellis, the labor is too intensive. Uh, but this, uh, v trellis, uh, you make it with, uh, you want to make it as tall as you can. Uh, I do have a little bit of a problem with some uh, pickers being not tall enough to get the berries at the top of the trellis, but I use eight foot T post. Uh, I space them a foot 70 degree angle. So essentially, uh, they're about three and a half feet apart. Uh, at chest height, and uh, uh, we use uh, electric fence uh, wire. Uh, I use 17 gauge wire early on, and it is cheap. Get a lot of miles out of a roll of 17 gauge, but the problem is that when you're pruning, the pruners don't see it, and it gets cut, and every time you you cut it, you got to repair it. And so you're going to pay more for the 14 gauge, but we've uh, that trellis system. Uh, we've had a V trellis that is probably 20 years old. And with the 14 gauge wire, we remove blackberries and plant blackberries back in into it. Uh, I might mention that we use a uh, Trichopere uh, uh, Roundup or glyphosate and crop oil as our way of removal of uh, varieties that we're taking out. Uh, but we use it at a, a one and a half percent rate and hit it multiple times starting in early September uh, to kill it out so that we get the uh, when we go back, we, we get those that we, that foliage, which we missed the first time. All right, we space the T-post out 20 to 25 feet apart, uh, three wires, 14 gauge. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, I got about 20 minutes left here. Uh, seedless vinifera grapes, uh, downy mildew is a, uh, a primary pathogen you're going to have to suspend control it if you're going to grow the vinifera hybrid grapes, whether they're seedless or not. Uh, and 
So you're going to require a fungicide program. Uh, and you got to going to have to do post harvest sprays because in seedless grapes, uh, the Arkansas ones, which are well adapted to the southeast, uh, you're going to have defoliation post harvest. And so you can come back with uh, your spray program. You can use uh, things like Mancozeb post harvest. Uh, so, and you're going to have to manage resistance. Uh, Ron, Ron Man and uh, oh, there's an, another very good downy mildew fungicide, which is going to jump me at the min minute. Pierce's disease that's caused by exobacidium. I mean, no, uh, Xylella fastidiosa, it's a fastidious bacteria, and all of them are susceptible. Uh, sharpshooter is the vector. Uh, or sometimes called squirrel bugs, because as you approach the bush, the sharpshooter goes behind the stem, just like a squirrel goes behind the stem. Uh, and those vectors, uh, the more efficient ones, are waiting on the grapevine to leaf out, and they're going to get it right away. So you, you've got the problem of getting something on there for sharpshooter control early on. Uh, uh, the neonicotinoids are labeled on grapes and there is one of the neonicotinoids is made uh, as a granular material. This offers you the, and uh, uh, so that offers you the opportunity to apply granulars ahead of uh, bud break and have them moved into the soil profile by rain. And uh, the word is on the street that uh, in the soil, the neonicotinoids are longer lived. Uh, so uh, so that, that's the Pierce's disease uh, solution. Grape root borer, if you don't control grape root borer, you're gonna be out of the vinifera or in vinifera hybrid business in about five or six or seven years. Uh, it's just a, a must control program. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of the Pierce's disease diagnosis uh, that have been made here in the Southeast were actually grape root borer damage. The symptoms of grape root borer and PD are almost identical. Uh, and so, uh, what we have found is the uh, grape root borer pheromone, just called GRB, I believe, uh, one per vine. They, they say 20 feet apart, but what we've settled on is one per vine. Uh, and uh, it has brought the problem under control for us. And we pull up all our vines. And so we are rarely see a grape root borer anymore. Uh, but we're seeing a new problem, and I don't know what that portends, uh, which are, we're calling Blackfoot. Uh, there is a disease called Blackfoot in Europe. I don't know if it's the same, but uh, I, I'm hoping that the land grant system can uh, address this issue. Uh, we're probably the, one of the older grape growers in the area, so our vines are older. Uh, Mars and Joy get kind of an honorable mention. They have what seems to me to be a little bit of tolerance to downy mildew. Uh, and I'm wondering if that doesn't offer a, an opportunity for some genetic energy engineering in the future to uh, double down on those uh, uh, genes that are contributing to that little bit of tolerance. Uh, Jupiter gets honorable mention uh, because of the quality of the berry. Uh, the customers just just love it. We see people strip clothes off their back and tie the sleeves up and make they, they can't seem to carry enough out of the field. Uh, they love that grape. Neptune gets a thumbs down because of anthracnose. We had Neptune. We took it back out. Uh, 
uh, because we could not control the anthracnose spraying everything we knew to spray. Uh, and so it's uh, 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 so let's go on to the next slide. Muscadines, lessons learned. Uh, grapefruit borer is a problem in muscadines. Most people think they're resistant. Well, they're not. <laughs> uh, it takes a lot longer for the grapefruit borer to kill a muscadine, but they will kill a muscadine. So we use the pheromone on the, the muscadines as a preventive program. Uh, one stick per vine and there, uh, one per vine with a 20 foot spacing on the muscadine seems to work okay. Uh, we've not had any go out to uh, uh, grape rope or that we know of. Uh, uh, we do plant some varieties. I think I mentioned it down here someplace. Uh, supreme at uh, 10 foot intervals. Uh, it's such a, a heavy bear that a number of years ago, I uh, lost a lot of them because they're susceptible to cold injury. When they overbear, I reduced uh, the planting distance to 10 feet and it seems to be working. I have a lot more growth on the vine. I still have lots of berries. In fact, it's too much this year. Uh, we didn't get them all harvested. Uh, uh, crimson clover we use in the grapes uh, probably contributes about 60 pounds of N a year. And so uh, I'm a little bit worried in some of the seedless muscadines that that's too much. Uh, so we're uh, looking at how to reduce our fertility in the seedless muscadines. Uh, some of them, like oh my, are extremely vigorous. Uh, and when they get real vigorous like that, they set less fruit, uh, maybe. Uh, so, uh, so in the seedless muscadines, uh, um, uh, we got our first from uh, uh, what's uh, Gardens Alive uh, and uh, Rasmataz. We have a pretty good size planting of Rasmataz. Uh, we don't like it because it's so much work. It's very difficult to pick and it's very difficult to process, uh, but the customers love it. Uh, and we charge them the heck out of it for them. Uh, it, uh, the only problems with rasmataz is spittlebug from grasses. And uh, um, no, uh, Stink bugs are a little bit of a problem. Uh, so, but there we're, we have in, in our planning, uh, oh my, uh, bronze uh, seedless muscadine. That's about the size of your uh, index finger to thumb na uh, nail to the, th uh, it's really big berry if it's the size of your thumbnail but most of them right around fingernail size. Uh, and uh, we are also, these are numbered varieties out of their program uh, and they uh, are releasing them. We've, our plantings are test. Uh, I'm bad at remembering numbers, especially if there's a number of them to remember. So I have labeled them, oh my, that is a, a, a an artificial name. It's not the right name. It's not the true name. Uh, the the breeder will name them at some point in the future. But I've named them. Oh my. Oh gosh. And oh goodness. Uh, just so I can talk about them with people and uh, get a feel for how they like them. Oh gosh is blue and just a little bit later than oh my, but overlaps with oh my quite a bit. Oh goodness is quite a bit later. Uh, mid-September to mid-October, and uh, uh, it's the biggest of the seedless ones. Uh, you're picking, uh, uh, oh goodness, uh, you want to pick it with the pedestal on. Uh, it has a wet scar if you try and pick it with the, and so uh, uh, they do not, the, the clusters do not ripen evenly, so 
it, it's a little bit tricky to, to harvest, but not that bad. We do a pretty good job and it holds up well. Once you pick it with the pedestal on and grade it so that the pedestal's on, uh, uh, I got about 12 minutes left. I need to move on. Uh, it'll keep in the cooler for a long time. It's a good keeper and it's kind of like Supreme in taste and uh, texture of the skin. Uh, according to the breeder, uh, it's uh, one of its parents is uh, Supreme. We're betting big on the Cetus uh, muscadines because the big black muscadines like Supreme and early fry and late fry are hard to sell. Uh, <laughs> now, the American population just does not like seeded grapes. If you can get a Southerner, they'll buy them going home and buy them in big quantities. They'll go away with 40, 50, sometimes 100, 200 pounds of them. Uh, and I sometimes wonder how they handle them. Some of them are winemakers, but some of them are just, they keep well in the refrigerator if they're picked with a dry scar. Uh, anyhow, let's move on. Next slide, figs uh, crop every year. Uh, never miss, they have been cold injured and they, that crop has been smaller some years than other, but that's one of the ones that bears on the current season's wood and they sell like hotcakes. Uh, we keep adding more plants. Uh, once established, you've got the prune, prune, prune to keep them down uh, to size. I'm still trying to work out a pruning system. The current pruning system is on uh, removing a third to a quarter of the canes each year, uh, shooting for a bush and trying to keep that bush in size. If I can think of it, remember it in time, that when the, those canes uh, come up uh, to uh, pinch the top of the cane to force branching, when they get about chest height or shoulder height or head height in there someplace, but that job does not always get done. Key to fix. They must be picked every day. This is not something you can let accumulate and go out there and pick a bunch of, which frustrates the customer. <laughs> uh, but if you don't pick them every day, you're going to have a much shorter shelf life. It's going to give you a better shelf life. And uh, you can avoid serious bee problems, uh, yellow jacket, wasp, and that sort of thing. Just love a fig. and. Most people uh, think birds made those conical holes in the figs, but that's not so. Uh, yellow jackets and those guys, they have a, a serrated tongues and the fig oozes sugar on the surface and they start lapping. They'll just lap a, a conical hole right in the side of the fig. And then if a pick your own person comes along and they grab the fig, because it looks perfectly all right from their side, they'll catch that bee inside there. For a little while, he'll be all right, but you better let go of it because if he can't get out when he decides he's threatened, he'll sting you. Uh, uh, competition from big box stores, virtually none. Uh, maybe a few figs from California. Uh, uh, scales are the biggest problem on figs. Uh, dormant oil is your solution. You, as soon as you get to leaf drop uh, on a warm uh, fall afternoon, go out there with your dormant oil and just give them a good dousing. Uh, head to toe. We do it backpack because most of our figs, because we don't have to spray them otherwise, are in really steep territory where we don't go with a, anything but a mower. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide. Uh, persimmons, this is the last crop we're going to talk about here today. Uh, lessons learned, persimmon sudden wilt is going to be your nemesis. Uh, this tree in this slide uh, is showing uh, classic symptoms of it. You'll notice that the tips of the branches are turning uh, yellowish. They're wilting and drooping. Eventually, they'll form a shepherd's croak. Uh, and uh, 
there is nothing once it's reached this stage as you see in this picture you can just kiss that tree goodbye it may take it uh, a year or two to die but uh, it won't have many fruit on it uh, and so you might as well take it out uh, the leaf in the upper right of this slide uh, is another diagnostic symptom you see the darkened veins there uh, caught at this stage that's where you, you're going to see a little later uh, that leaf will have uh, angular black spots on it where the veins come together and that's diagnostic for uh, persimmon wilt. Uh, I found a material called criterion uh, Persimmon wilt's caused by xylella fastidiosis, the same organism that uh, causes Pierce's disease in grape. Uh, and uh, it is labeled on persimmons, criterion is. It's a metacroplid branch granules. And uh, you want to put it on just before uh, bud break, uh, preferably with a rain shortly thereafter. And uh, because those vectors of it are uh, waiting on bud break out there for you. Uh, and uh, it may that you may still see sharpshooters on the tree, but they don't like it. Uh, they, they don't like feeding on the tree. And uh, uh, so I think it's working. Uh, we're on our third year of after we learned what was killing the trees uh, and we're seeing less and less trees die the first year we had a bunch of trees die uh, so the trees are expensive they're going to cost you uh, 30 40 bucks a piece so uh, you don't just jump into the persimmon business uh, they're on a native rootstock uh, and so and those rootstocks produce suckers, which provides a little bit of a weed control problem. Uh, and so uh, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, other problems with persimmons, uh, narrow crotch angles. That's especially true if uh, they're grown in full sun. Uh, and what happens is you have bark inclusion in those narrow crotch angles. And then the Persimmons load up on the tree and that branch splits out. Uh, if it doesn't split totally out, Botrysphere uh, gets in, at, in the cracks there. And uh, Botrysphere, once the tree is stressed, it can go to the ground. And so uh, the trees are gone. Uh, so, uh, and it results in death of the tree, hastens the death in case of. It just if it doesn't have botrysphere, it's and it does have persimmon wilt, uh, it'll still die, but it botrysphere will make the death quicker. Uh, stink bugs is the next problem. We do not have a good control program. Um, hoping that uh, belay will be labeled. Uh, belay is a pyrethroid that is rather persistent, and we could have a, a rather large pre-harvest interval if we can talk people into uh, that. It's a, a primary pathogen that migrates into your field. Uh, we're trying right now, use belay on everything but the, the persimmon tree. <laughs> and uh, so um, and maybe if they try feeding on weeds or grass, they'll uh, they'll find us undesirable. If you apply it on the tree, I think PHI is gonna be a problem that uh, on most crops, belay has a pretty long uh, pre-harvest interval. So, uh, uh, so I'm working on that one. <laughs> uh, let's see here, let's go to the next slide. All right, marketing lessons. And I got about two minutes. Social media, social media, social media. Uh, my daughter has taught me that social media is important. My other daughter has taught me that our website's important. The only thing I, uh, they don't read. 
your customers. <laughs> you, you, uh, they, I get bunches of phone calls and they're asking me the same questions that I've just I answered in a newsletter, answered in social media. It's on our website. Uh, and then the other thing is our story. Uh, what is our niche? Who, where, what, how, and why? Uh, and uh, define your niche for them and work on your image. Uh, ours is we're shooting for sustainability, resilience, uh, uh, and sequestering as much carbon as we possibly can for the future of our, our grandchildren, uh, and including mine. <laughs> So, uh, all right, there I am. I made it by the bell, I think. I am, I'll hang out here and uh, Roland, if you, you're there, uh, we can continue to answer questions if people wanna hang out. Uh, but if they need to go to another session, I understand. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that absolutely action-packed, information-packed presentation, Walker. Um, it really did feel like you distilled 43 whole years into, into an hour and a half. So thank you very much. Uh, we will. We do have the uh, can stay on for just a little while longer. If, if folks do have questions, uh, you should be able to unmute yourselves um, and, and pose a question or raise your hand or um, use the chat. I have a question from Nancy Herndon. Uh, which of your crops do you do, are profitable? Oh, um, basically, they, we we charge for our crops. Uh, the the blueberries uh, uh, were just a little bit under. If you follow the blackberry people, we're just a little bit under the average price, uh, but we're way above the low price that's being charged for blackberries. Uh, and uh, the same for blueberries. Uh, people are willing to pay for stuff that they believe is sustainably grown. And that's where we try and make our story about sustainability. We try to avoid using plant pharmaceuticals unless they're absolutely necessary. And if we do use them, we try and use them when they're not going to be put on the fruit the actual fruit. And so uh, blueberries are good, blackberries are good, uh, the figs are fantastic, <laughs> uh, the uh, persimmons are fantastic, uh, the seedless muscadines uh, so far have, uh, we sell out of them as quick as we can get them harvested. That, that's, that's the trick and it cost us a bunch to harvest them. So we're charging uh, uh, five dollars a pint for seedless muscadines. Wow. Uh, uh, so that's that's only twelve ounces. Uh, I see Keith Sims waving his hand. Does he have a question? Uh, yes, um, yes, sir. How do you clean your equipment? How do you clean your spray equipment? How do I clean my uh, spray equipment? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, well, I use a couple different things. So. Uh, mainly ammonia, uh, that especially on herbicide equipment. Uh, we'll triple rinse the uh, herbicide equipment and then uh, come back with, uh, fill the tank half up and put uh, about a half ounce of, uh, I have a little shot glass with marks on it at where I do this, uh, the half ounce of ammonia in the tank uh, with, um, the, I don't only wash the, the big spray tank where I'm spraying, uh, depending on whether the product is labeled on what I'm going to be. If it's labeled for that crop, I won't wash it out, even though I may not need it at that particular time. Uh, we do triple rinse, though. Uh, take the thing off, take the hose and sprayer, wash the inside out, let it drain, wash it out, let it drain, wash it out. And we wash the lid too. So, but, uh, and if I'm really worried, I'll put a, some ammonia in the uh, thing, but you can also use vinegar too. All right, you had another question? 
Uh, yes, there's commercial tank cleaner. Uh, and I was wondering that uh, somehow along the, the way I had purchased that. If you think a, submerge, a, a commercial tank uh, cleaner is, uh, is uh, advantageous, and how long are you comfortable with laying, uh, leaving a herbicide or pesticide in the sprayer? How many days? Uh, Those two questions. I'm comfortable with a uh, couple days, because uh, sometimes you finish uh, in the evening and it gets dark on you, and so you got to okay. leave the tank till the next day. And you, bear in mind that I'm doing this all the herbicides is backpack. Uh, the, uh, uh, beyond that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you end up with a little bit left, I'll, I'll wash it out. And uh, I'm a believer in, I have an area of the driveway, which is a long one on our place. If you look at that first picture, you can see it. Uh, I have what I call biologically dynamic zone. I'll take my excess spray and dribble it out in that area and uh, as, as uh, a place to, to get rid of it. Now I've selected that area for the fact that it, that it rain that falls on, it's not gonna go off to the sides. Oh, uh, so that's, uh, I have never used a commercial tank cleaner. I have always just used ammonia or vinegar uh, as a tank cleaner. Thank you. Walker, we have a few more questions uh, from the chat. Uh, first being, what varieties of persimmons are you planting and uh, what age plant are you putting in the ground? Uh, I'm having to, uh, with the persimmons, first let's answer the variety question. We're planting, Isu was the first variety we planted. We wanted something that was early that would overlap with the blueberries and the muscadines. Uh, and then the second variety we planted was Fuyu Matsumoto. Uh, and then the third variety we planted is uh, uh, Fuyu, um, boy, it's going to jump me at this moment. Uh, oh, boy. It, I'll think of it. Anyhow, all right. What age do we buy? What I do is... Uh, the, uh, the only place I've been able to find good trees has been, uh, and I'm not putting the plug in for them, but actually that's where I get them, is Chestnut Hill Nursery in Florida. And uh, so, and I call them up. I try and estimate what up my needs are for the following year. And I'll call them up a year in advance, sometimes a year and a quarter in advance and say, hey, I'm going to need this many Isu, this many Matsumoto, and, oh boy, it still won't come. Uh, <laughs> nice try. And, and the theory here is that each of the Fuyus is a little bit later than Isu. Isu is the earliest, and they're all round, flat uh, persimmons. So to the customer, it's all the same. So I, I, I just call them persimmons. But the objective here is to spread the harvest out. And I'm thinking that we'll be able to go from September 15th to November 15th with persimmons. Uh, and uh, another lesson I'm learning the hard way is you got to prune persimmons. Uh, even the isu, which is supposedly a smaller tree than fuyu, uh, it the even with a ladder because the the fruits are extremely heavy the branches are willowy and uh, uh, so we're embarking on a pruning system as we speak uh, persimmons has a rel relatively low chewing requirement and uh, uh, so we start we don't prune anything until the chewing requirement has been satisfied so. Uh, Persimmons about a hundred hours. So, um, and so the plants will be about a year old at least when they sh are shipped to you from Chestnut Hill. Yeah, yeah, uh, year old. But occasionally they got two-year-old trees that didn't sell, and so I'll, I'll buy a two-year-old tree. There, the difference in price is a little bit more, but uh, usually not more than about five or seven dollars more. 
terrific. Or a two-year-old tree. But I prefer the one-year-old tree. Okay. There is another chat question, um, and uh, I think this is probably relating to, to multiple crops, but um, in terms of the different varieties, what is the importance of staggering harvest dates um, in, in, in terms of, um, you know, continuity of the UPIC operation? Yeah. Uh, so our objective is to have a cash flow uh, as much of the year as possible so that uh, we can pay the help, pay ourselves a little bit. We don't get paid much, uh, especially me. Uh, I have a retirement income, so I don't worry about paying me. Uh, uh, so uh, the, we spread the harvest so that we start June 1 and hopefully go to November 15th and then start after Christmas and go to Easter. So we have two windows of time for uh, projects uh, between November and December for uh, putting in new plantings. Uh, you plant in the fall in the Southeast. Uh, and then uh, uh, those things that didn't get done in November and December, you got a last shot at it in May. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and for our last question, um, the question here from the chat is, um, how would you summarize the, econo the economics of grapes on a per acre basis? So, you know, in terms of, um, uh, you know, That's a difficult net, net, net returns um, on, on your grapes per acre. It's hard for me to answer that one because we don't uh, segregate our figures uh, based on crop. In other words, m many of our prices, or almost all of them, are the same for grapes, blueberries, blackberries, uh, figs. Uh, we have the same price for all crops. And so we have no way of separating that. We don't use computers much. Uh, the only thing we use a computer for is credit cards. Um, we'd like to avoid credit cards because uh, people who pick for us, they like to be caved in cash at the end of the row. And we do keep a, a log of uh, what they picked and how much they made. Uh, but so I really, uh, the sense is that we're making money. But I, I good figures. I would refer to an economist and uh, you know put in your numbers. So, so I guess what you're saying is that you're you're managing the costs of your production on a whole farm basis and not on a not on a crop by crop basis. Yes, and a holistic sort of approach of keeping customers coming in as often as as you can. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's it. Terrific. Uh, well, again, this has been incredibly informative. Thank you so much, Walker, for, uh, for this um, incredible uh, presentation. And I thank everyone who's uh, been joining us here and for your excellent questions. Uh, we, again, are uh, glad to be hosting you here at this year's Sustainable Agriculture Conference. Uh, we will go ahead and, uh, and uh, close the presentation here just uh, 15 minutes over. But I um, want to express our gratitude to you, Walker, for sharing your time with us. All right. Everybody note that on that first slide, my uh, contact information is there. And so I'm happy to answer questions. Terrific. I want to see more of us out there. That's not of us. <laughs> and we are also, all of the contact information for all the speakers is available through uh, the, the conference app. So uh, please do take advantage. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Walker. And everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks right, you so too. much, Walker. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye-bye.